It's our first meeting in CFS. We are oncologists. We um, are part of a department of oncology on the western part of the Norwegian coast, serving a population of about a million. And what we normally do is medical oncology and radiation oncology. So this is quite a different area. Before starting my presentation, I have to proclaim a conflict of interest, and that is that our hospital has a, a patent and patents pending on the issue of uh, B-cell depletion therapy for chronic fatigue syndrome. And in this, uh, I myself and Esten Flüger are named as inventors. As just uh, stated, uh, most of what we're going to say today is previously unpublished data. It has not come out in, in, any, in any journal yet, so it will be uh, devastating for the possibility pub to publish if this data is, is, is uh, sent out on the net in beforehand. So I ask you, for the sake of the field, not to do that. Our interest in this area started quite co coincidentally, about three and a half years back. We had a patient with Hodgkin's disease, a lymphoma, who had uh, a CFS from 1997. And in 2001, she got Hodgkin's disease. She had a, a very debilitating uh, condition. She had to use a, a wheelchair for her CFS. And uh, she had uh, totally four different uh, course types of chemotherapy during the course of her illness. Started in 2001, and she had a recurrence which she was treated for in 2007. But the very remarkable thing that happened was that during one of these courses, uh, with this particular uh, regimen, she started uh, uh, getting much better from her CFS. It was quite un unexpected for us and, and for her in special. We had thought that she would tolerate chemotherapy poorer than other patients. But in fact, all the symptoms of CFS practically vanished during the chemotherapy. And it lasted about three months after uh, the chemotherapy course was over and then Gradually, the symptoms came back as they had been before. This patient, every time she came to the outpatient department for follow-up for her lymphoma, she said, what happened to me? What happened to me? You have to find out about it. She had got a taste of life and wanted it back. And that started the whole thing. The chemotherapy regimen was MIME. And that uh, contains four different chemotherapy therapeutic drugs. Two of them were parts of other combinations that the patients had, and we said probably they're not responsible for the, the, the bettering of her symptoms. Uh, the two that were left, uh, we found out that probably methotrexate was the drug that was working. And we know that that is a drug that is used for some autoimmune diseases, and we also know uh, that this drug given on a weekly basis, has a relatively good B lymphocyte depleting uh, mode of action. And uh, doing a quick survey of the literature, we found out that CFS patients probably have some distortion of immune function. And in the daily clinic in our oncology department, we're well used to manipulating with the immune system with the patient, especially with a drug called rituximab, which selectively affects uh, B lymphocytes. And uh, we thought that we couldn't give this patient chemotherapy ther therapeutic drugs since she was cured of her lymphoma, but we found out that maybe we could give her rituximab. And uh, just to make you acquainted with this uh, uh, monoclonal antibody, which is directed toward the CD20 antigen, which is uh, on uh, the surface of uh, B lymphocytes. It is a partly human, uh, human and partly mouse uh, antigen, has a light chains, heavy chains, and it uh, works uh, through three different mechanisms, which I, don't, I won't uh, go into. But it has a very specific role in, 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 uh, in um, just uh, affecting uh, cells that have CD20 on their, uh, on their uh, outer aspects. Uh, as you know, uh, B-cell lymphoma cells usually are of the B-cell type. About 85% of them are. And therefore, this drug kills uh, uh, B-cell lymphoma cells. But it also kills the normal uh, B-cells. 
And if you look at the, a, a chart of the development of, of B cells, you start here with the stem cells, and it goes on to the plasma cells. And if you look at this uh, red arrow here, you see in this area, CD20 is expressed. And in all that part of the development, uh, the B cell will be susceptible to the monoclonal antibody. That is, the stem cells, the very early uh, B cells will not be affected, and the plasma cells will not be affected because CD20 is not there. That means that uh, even if you give this drug, you, you can have antibody production by the plasma cells, and the patients are to a little very little degree uh, increased in susceptibility for uh, infections. Um, what I'm uh, talking about now is uh, previously known. We published this in BMC Neuro Neurology in 2009. And uh, it is actually the treatment of the first patient and two additional patients that we were given permission to treat by the Ethical Committee. Um, so I won't go into detail, but what we saw in all three is that all three had a marked but temporary clinical response after the treatment. The two first patients, they had what we call an early response pattern. Uh, from about six, seven weeks after giving this drug as a single infusion, uh, the patients started improving. And the improvement lasted three to four months. Uh, the third pilot patient had a different uh, pattern. Uh, we nearly thought the patient was not going to have any response because it went up to five, five and a half months before something happened. Before that, she had some minor um, fluctuations, which we thought could be a part of the, the natural disease. But after this point, she had a, a remarkable response on all the symptoms that CFS had given, as noted here. Uh, that all the symptoms in all three patients uh, improved told us that something concerning the B lymphocytes had to do with the maintenance of the central symptoms in this disease. We were quite sure that that was the case. But of course, we were now in a dilemma. Uh, after seeing the two first patients, we told each other, uh, can we really believe this? Could this be a placebo effect? It didn't seem so, but could we really believe it? Could be. Uh, and we found out that to convince ourselves and even more the medical community that something was going on here, we had to do a placebo-controlled study. Also, this is really out of our field. We're oncologists. We have a rather busy department running. And uh, using a lot of time on CFS while we have other obligations would be difficult. So we decided to go directly for a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. And what we did was that we tried to estimate the response rates. We had three patients in the row. One of them had had lymphoma. The two others had not no, no malignancy in beforehand. Uh, uh, we had to estimate what kind of response rates could we anticipate. And what were the placebo... Uh, what, what kind of response could we see in the placebo group? And this made us put up the trial, which Istan uh, Flügel will be telling you about uh, in the next minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I think it's very nice to be here and listen to all the people with ex very much experience in, in CFS and, and, and me, and we are learning a lot. Um, as Olaf told you, we are working with lymphomas and brain tumors mostly. And in fact, I've only seen 53 CFS patients, but I've talked a lot to those 53. While some of you others have seen thousands, I know. But I will take you through the clinical study, uh, and then we will speculate a little bit with you, and then uh, Ulla will summarize in the end. So this clinical study is a randomized phase two study it's placebo-controlled and double-blind and single sample. The patients uh, received either rituximab, 500 milligram per, squ per square meter, two infusions two weeks apart, or uh, saline, two infusions two weeks apart. We included 30 patients, 15 in each group, the first patient in June 2008 and the last patient in June 2009. 
and with a follow-up for at least 12 months. So uh, the follow-up period was finished in June 2010. So we made, I will show you in the next slide, some uh, symptom scores that the patients assessed, self-reported, and also um, by the physicians at each visit in the outpatient clinic. And uh, Olaf told you that we made a protocol when we, had, when we had seen the first two patients, both with an early response pattern. So we made the primary endpoint, the changes in self-reported CFS symptoms three months after intervention. And secondary endpoints every second month through the follow-up period. And we would uh, estimate the overall response rate and the toxicity. Uh, we use the FACULA criteria for inclusion. Um, I can tell you that uh, retrospectively, we have checked them according to the Canadian criteria. And I think that two of the patients did not meet the Canadian criteria, while 28 of the patients met also those. Um, these are the demographic variables in the two groups. The age was 37 years in the rituximab group and 30 one and a half year in the placebo group, uh, 80 and 60% were women, and their disease, uh, CFS disease duration varied, was five years, varying from one to 13 in the rituximab group, and 8.1 years in the mean in the placebo group with a range from 0 0.7 to 18 years. And about 70% of the patients had either a defined clinical inf infection prior to onset of CFS or a possible clinical infection. And we, we tried to assess the clinical course the last year before inclusion. And it seems that you can see that here. Uh, one patient in, in, in each group thought they had improved some the last year before inclusion, while most had either st stable disease or felt that the disease was worsening. We also looked for previous or other autoimmune diseases in the patients. And you can see that 20% of the patients in the rituximab group and 27 in the placebo group had a previous autoimmune disease. And when we look at the first degree relatives, the figures were like this, 33% and 47%, which is more than what you would expect from the general population. Um, this is a scheme that we developed for pre-registration pre uh, before intervention. These are the baseline self-reported symptoms that the patients were asked to, to, to uh, score from a scale from one to 10. Symptoms related to fatigue, uh, post-exertional malaise or exhaustion, lack of daily functioning, need for rest, and also the pain symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and this group of so-called other symptoms, which include some from the autonomic nervous system and also how the patients felt that the disease had affected their quality of life the last three months before intervention. So this was, um, this was the baseline characterization. And this is how the symptom scores looked, looked in the two groups. In this uh, slide, uh, the patients should, uh, should then uh, a score from one, no symptoms, and up to 10 with, when they felt that the symptom was very pronounced. And the fatigue score was, you can see the main point from this slide is that they, they were quite balanced between the two groups. The patients generally assessed to have a lot of symptoms, I think, with a fatigue score rain, uh, mean 8.1 and 7.9 in the two groups. But there are some patients that fall a bit outside. For instance, in pain score, one in the placebo group had almost no pain and was one of the two patients that did not meet the, uh, the Canadian criteria. But generally, they reported a lot of symptoms. Then, this is the scheme that we used during follow-up. It's a, some kind of a global assessment scale. It's exactly the same symptoms, uh, and the patients were asked to register every second week, week for the whole 12-year follow-up period. And, uh, these are, they were asked to score according to this scale. One, uh, three is the value for no change in the, two, in the two week period. Two, slight worsening. One, moderate worsening. And zero, if they experienced a major worsening of that symptom. And correspondingly for the improvement, four, slight improvement. Five, 
moderate improvement, and six major improvement. And the, we, we wanted to make a system that captures close to the raw data. Um, so the mean of the fatigue symptoms at each second week interval is what we call a fatigue score. And we have the cognitive score, which is the mean of these three cognitive symptoms. The pain score, which is the mean of the pain symptoms for those that the patient actually had. And we have a mean of these other symptoms from the two dominating, which we thought were most characteristic for that patient's disease. Uh, just to mention, we also made a similar registration at, by the physicians in the outpatient clinic. The patients were also seen by a neurologist before treatment at baseline and at four months. At all, all uh, follow-ups, Ola or I also saw the patients. And the response data uh, are mainly based on the self-reported symptom changes recorded every second week. And the main response, we think it was correct to define from the fatigue score. But generally, the symptom scores, are, as I will show you in the next slides, the different symptom scores followed each other closely during response and relapse. And remember that we designed this protocol after observing only the first two pilot patients, both with an early response pattern. And that turned out not to be the typical response pattern for the patients because as I will show you, most of the patients respond later, starting to improve from between three and seven months after treatment. This is one example. This is from example from one patient. I will show you just a few of these. Uh, this is the time in weeks at the x-axis, and it is the change in symptom score on the y-axis. So three is the baseline, or no change from from pre-intervention, these are improvement, slight improvement, moderate improvement, and six major improvement, and the worsening. You have the B cell counts that we have measured by flow cytometry, uh, shown in these black dots with a scale for the B cells on this axis, and the different colors of the lines. The black is the fatigue score, every second week recorded. The red one is the cognitive score, the green one is the pain score, and the the uh, orange one, the other symptom score. So this is a patient in a rituximab group, but you can clearly see that there's a change in the curve starting from about two, three months after, after uh, treatment, and the curves are generally following each other, and there's a response in this patient with a maximum from four to 10 months. The response totally lasted until 15 months after treatment, that will, that will means that it was response past the formal study period. So when we talk about the overall response in a little while, it's defined from the fatigue score, which is the black line. This is the mean of the fatigue symptoms, the black line. You can see that the symptoms are starting to, to worsen uh, after a period of major response, but it's not back to uh, the pre-intervention level. This is another patient with a, also with a response. Uh, the jet lines are not following, following each other so closely, but there's a clear trend for improvement in all the different scores from three to 12 months, maximum from four to 10 months. This is one example of a patient with a little, little bit different response uh, uh, pattern, starting to improve from about three, four, four, months after treatment, but then gradually improving steadily. And um, uh, she is uh, one from two of the patients with response that has not had a relapse for uh, the follow-up from uh, three years follow-up until now. The study period was 12 months that we will report in the paper, but we have also followed the responders for see, to see how long it actually lasted. Uh, by the way, this patient is the only one that was not rapidly B cell depleted. You can see that she was not adequately B cell depleted until 16 weeks for some reason that we don't know, while all the other patients had a very low B cell level after a few weeks. This is one example of a patient with an early response pattern, which resembles that we could see in the first two pilot patients from two to six months. 
And finally, one example of a patient with a short but late and late response. She had, like the patient Olaf told you about, an unstable disease for the first four or five months. But then from six months after treatment, she had a dramatic improvement of all symptoms. And she told us that during these three months, she felt healthy for the first time in, uh, since in her teenager, um, in, in her adolescence. This response was the, one of the shortest, lasting only from six to nine months with a relapse of all symptoms thereafter. Two of the patients in the placebo group reported major improvement during the follow-up period. You can see this. This is a placebo patient. The B cells are not falling. And she reported a clear response, but was one of the two patients that did not meet the Canadian criteria. So the major response definition was that a lasting, at least moderate, fatigue score for at least six consecutive weeks, including registrations also of a marked response during that period. All the responders estimated the effect to be of major importance for the quality of life. And it turned out that nine patients in the rituximab group achieved a major response from these criteria. And in addition, one with a moderate response, which is 10 out of 15, or 67%. This summarizes the fatigue scores during follow-up. On the x-axis is the weeks after intervention with the time intervals, and it's the same axis on the y-axis with the baseline level at three. The red, ones, the red dots are the rituximab patient, and the black ones are the placebo patients. And you can see that at the primary endpoint, at three months, which is in this, there's no difference between the groups. There's no uh, di clear difference between the fatigue scores in the red and the black, that is the rituximab and placebo patients. So the primary endpoint is negative. But then uh, it separates. From uh, four to six months, there's a trend for uh, difference in distribution by the Mann-Whitney U test with a p-value of 0.06, and there, then there's a significant difference at uh, six to seven months, uh, seven to eight months, with a trend from eight to nine months, and significant difference from, ni from uh, nine to 10 months after treatment. You can see there are much more red dots in the upper area than the black ones. Generally, there are two patients in the placebo group, you can see, that uh, reports major improvement. Likewise, we had a similar score for uh, the physician-assessed fatigue score that was recorded by the doctors at the outpatient clinic. It shows exactly the same trend. So the overall response was uh, 10 out of 15 in the placebo group and 2 out of 15 in the placebo group, which is highly significant difference. And with the, within the 12 months uh, study period, the mean duration of response was 25 weeks, and then there were four patients with the response duration past those 12 months, and two without signs of relapse after three years. No serious adverse events, no serious infections, two patients with uh, previous, uh, with pre-existing psoriasis had a moderate worsening during follow-up, which I think is a possible side effect from rituxan, Two hospitalizations during, hospitalizations during follow-up was not interpreted to be related to intervention. That was one patient in the placebo group with a myocardial infarction and one in the rituximab group with some abdominal pain that had a corpus luteum cyst that was uh, interpreted to be a normal finding. The side effects that was, were reported during follow-up, I told you about the psoriasis, psoriasis worsening, and there were some... Uh, the infusion-related uh, complaints were quite similar both in the placebo group and the rituxan group. Two patients had some itching that could be related to the, in, in the rituximab group. Two patients in each group report, reported some worsening of the symptoms the first two months. And some patients felt uneasy and sleepless while they were at the same time improving. Uh, and we think that it's not related to rituximab itself, but more on the effect on the disease. 
This is the, these are the B cell counts during follow-up. The black ones are the placebo group. The red one are the ritux rituximab responders, and the blue one is the rituximab non-responders. And you can see that there's no clear difference between in the B cell levels at, at the different time points between responders and non-responders. And you can see that it is rising from four, six, eight months and uh, starting back to the normal levels. Uh, some patients, are, uh, they are usually back to normal levels in B cell within one to two years of the treatment. We couldn't find any signs of XMLV in our CFS patients using uh, 10 different PCR setups. We also did culturing of lymphocytes with the LNK prostate cancer cell line, uh, but we have not performed serology. These are, I'll just go through that now, but we have used, uh, tried to reproduce as closely as possible uh, from the published studies. So the summary of this study is that there's a st statistically significant difference in favor of the rituximab group for overall response and statistically significant difference in favor of rituximab for secondary endpoints six, eight, and 10 months after treatment. The primary endpoint is negative, which is due to difference in time to responses and that we estimated the wrong time frame when we made the protocol, and there's no major toxicity. Uh, some of the conclusions that I think we can make. So in responders, all symptoms seem to be in influenced. And that indicates to us that the B lymphocytes have an important role in symptom maintenance in at least some cases of CFS. And there's a time lag before the clinical responses. That varies, but most responses start to occur from between three and seven months after treatment, starting to occur from that. So the B cells are, low, uh, are very low within the first two weeks. And, uh, while it's a lag time for almost a half a year and, or more before the clinical response. And that indicates to us that um, uh, the cytokine elimination is not a plausible mechanism for the symptom, uh, main, uh, symptom relief. And I think that the time to clinical responses also makes the virus clearance hypothesis unlikely, although we cannot rule it out for sure. Uh, the extent of CFS symptom relief varies from dramatic with a total change in the patient's life to more moderate and to below the threshold defined as response. Five of the patients did not achieve a significant response. And also the responding patients, they quickly adapt to the new situation without cognitive therapy. So experiencing the responses does not stop symptoms recurrence indicating that psychological mechanism play a minor role, I think. So I'll, uh, I think uh, I would like to use only the f next five, six minutes to speculate a little bit before Olaf summarizes. And uh, these data that we will, uh, what we will talk to you about uh, regarding our hypothesis is uh, not necessarily based on hard facts, but how we try to fit the clinical data with the response uh, pattern that we see. We believe that CFS is a form of autoimmune disease, at least in a subset of patients, and that rituximab and B-cell depletion eliminates B-cells, including autoreactive B-cell clones. It's, a, it's like a resetting of the B-cell system. And the time lag from B-cell depletion to clinical response is consistent with a gradual elimination of autoantibodies. They have a half-life of three to four weeks although we cannot rule out that in some cases also a viral elimination could be a mechanism. This is just a, a schematic interpretation. For some, this is a plot with a time on the x-axis. The B cells are the red line. You can see that it drops quickly and during the first year maybe it, it, it rises again. This is thought to be the X, that's the disease factor, which could be an autoantibody or some other unknown mechanism. Even though the B cells fall quickly, there's a lag time, and the green one is the clinical response. Before, the X is under some kind of threshold, permitting the clinical response. And then this patient has a long response, we call it, before the X factor is uh, rising and the patients experience a relapse. 
So if this x factor is very much higher in, to start with, uh, then you can imagine that you reach this threshold at a later time point, while the B cells are already on their way up again. So that could be an explanation for the short and late responses that we see. And maybe some of the non-responders are like this scenario. They never reach down to the threshold in this factor, which could be an autoantibody, before uh, the symptoms, uh, be, uh, be, uh, so that before the B cells are risen again. And what about those patients with no relapse? Is it some kind of resetting of the B cell system? So even though the B cells are rising, they never experience uh, a clear relapse. So some facts. Uh, the clinical effect of B cell depletion and the time frame responses indicate to us an autoimmune process, possibly mediated through an autoantibody. We know that for many patients, the onset is directly after an infection. And we know that several infections, both viral and bacterial, have been reported to precede CFS. For instance, Epstein-Barr virus. And we know that the prognosis is variable. Uh, many patients are severely disabled for the rest of their lives. Some patients recover. And Dr. Bell told us about that earlier this day. So we have tried to do some spin-off studies. We have performed flow cytometrics, lymphocyte subset, and NCO cell counts on all samples before intervention and at every visit during follow-up. We have done gene expression analysis on peripheral blood mononuclear cells prior to intervention. We have measured 50 cytokines in the samples prior to intervention. And what seems to me so far, we have not finished analyzing all the data, but there's no clear picture emerging. So that our main focus has been for the last two years, trying to detect specific anti autoantibodies in the serum of patients, which could be a reliable biomarker. Uh, but that's like finding the needle in the haystack. So I think that we need to analyze the clinical picture, and the patients are themselves the clue to tell us about the putative target if there is an autoimmune process. So if you could follow uh, uh, our thoughts with the assumption that there is an autoantibody. Let's just say it. It's not, not sure. But I think that CFS is a more or less distinct clinical picture. Uh, I won't lecture you about all this because you know as, uh, more than me about it. But all the patients have major and lasting fatigue and malaise after exertion. Um, Always the patients with some variation have sensory amplification with the pain, light hypersensitivity, noise hypersensitivity. Patients have cognitive dysfunction that's more variable but always present to some degree. What is most variable among patients is the autonomic symptoms we think from our 53 that we have been assessing. And then Let's say that this disease is not caused by a disseminated viral infection, at least not driving the symptoms. To explain the clinical picture, if there's a target for an autoimmune response, I think we have to look for the primary symptoms of this disease, which is caused directly by the autoimmune process, and look for what we may call secondary symptoms, because it's very difficult to explain such a huge clinical picture uh, without some kind of model. So what our question is, which symptoms are the primary and which are the secondary? What is the, that's the same as asking what is the principal primary target for this putative autoimmune process? And one important question is, how can different infections, both viral and bacterial, give an abnormal immune response with a similar clinical picture? I think that's a crucial question. So these infections with different microbes they must result in some kind of post-infectious abnormal immune response which target the same systems because the patients are so alike. They have the same clinical picture. And we know that the antibodies from these infections must have more or less the same molecular mimicry. They are cross-reactive to the same host epitope, I think. So the disturbed function of this symptom, which is a target for the autoimmune response, must 
pr produce the primary and main symptoms of the disease. And we are speculating if these are the main and primary symptoms, the fatigue amplification and the sensory amplification. <coughs> and the defect function of the primary uh, system gives all the secondary symptoms, which are the cognitive dysfunction and the autoimmune symptoms that vary more among patients. Um, so if the fatigue amplification and the sensory amplification is the primary symptom, are the primary symptoms, and the cognitive dysfunction and autonomic symptoms are secondary, that is a result of a massive wrong sensory input to the brain. We think that this autoantibody targets some kind of sensory filter in the sensory uh, nervous system so that the patients are overloaded by sensory information including fatigue amplification and pain, light, noise, uh, that the brain is overloaded and that gives the secondary symptoms which are the cognitive dysfunction and the autonomic symptoms. So if the brain gets constantly wrong sensory information on excessive exhaustion, exhaustion but caused by very limited exertion, on major pain in muscles and joints and headache, but caused by very small stimuli. The brain gets information on a massive light exposure, but it's a normal light in the room. Then I think that the, uh, the brain could react accordingly, put up these autonomic symptoms and cognitive dysfunction, like in the end of the marathon race. I don't think patients are uh, athletes which are in the last kilometer of a marathon race do not have a very good cognitive function and are often uh, experiencing gastrointestinal symptoms and so on. So I think we can learn from other examples in human medicine of post-infectious autoimmune diseases, which may resolve completely, but because some of the ME patients can do that with a distinct clinical picture that can be preceded by different infections, yet with autoantibodies targeting the same system. And those examples exist. So why is there so, uh, to our knowledge, little consistency of biological data, cytokines, immunological alterations, and mediators? I think that in other autoimmune diseases, like dermatomyositis, for instance, or lupus, the target organ is quite large, with evidence of inflammation <coughs> during exacerbation of disease, which can be reflected in the patient's serum. In CFS, I think that the target for the autoimmune process, some part of the sensory nervous system, may be very small, and the inflammation modest, and therefore not readily reflected in this serum, making it difficult to find consistency when examining uh, large groups. So when the patients respond to rituxan, patients with major bowel symptoms, dizziness, sweating, autonomic symptoms, they have, may have a complete normalization of these symptoms after removing the B cells. And patients with major cognitive symptoms may experience complete normalization of cognitive function, those with a major response after rituxan treatment. So that's something to think about. So if our assumptions concerning autoimmunity are correct, I think that we will find biomarkers and treatment in addition to B cell depletion and rituximab. Uh, there are also several new B cell depleting agents in the pipeline. And I think that in severely affected patients, which do not maybe respond to rituximab, uh, or in patients which are severely affected and the delay may be too long before clinical response. Because if, if you have a huge level of the autoantibody before treatment, maybe it could take a year to reach below the threshold permitting a clinical response. Then I think that plasma exchange, for instance, could be a useful pre treatment before rituximab. And we, are, uh, we have applied for an amendment to one of the studies that are rolling now, and we have been granted by the ethical committee. We will do plasma exchange in, in five patients with uh, major symptoms. So then Ulla will uh, finish the talk.
time, time is running out, so I'll try to be brief. I'll jump over this one. Um, it, it, this is just pilot patient number three telling about her life now after we came in her life. Uh, she's now a pupil uh, running on the mountains in the farther north along the coast. It's, uh, ex it's an extremely different situation for her, but we'll jump over that and instead uh, say what happened after her first response in the pilot study. She had a good effect for four months, then all the symptoms started com coming back again. And here, on the way down again, she, she said, why did I go into this? I've tasted life again. Am I going back again? And she had to. Here, she was given a new treatment, exactly the same time frame as the first time, then the symptoms started waning off. Duration, just as the first time. This happens to all the patients that we give treatment. The time lag is the same for each patient, not necessarily the same as for another, but for them it's the same. So our reasoning was that if we gave rituximab uh, 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 with, with intervals that did not let the patient down like this, we could maybe have a, a better total situation. And that is the basis for our optimization study, which is now ongoing. Uh, that is that we, we fill in with rituximab in these patients, not just giving single treatments. And so we have two new studies that have been approved. They are both uh, phase two studies. The first one included 25 patients. Uh, here, nine patients from the placebo group in the randomized study are included. That was in the first protocol. That is, if we found a positive effect, we would give these patients with placebo also the possibility of getting rituximab. And also eight patients with response in the first study are included. And in addition, we took in two patients without response in the first study. And the reason was to see if we kept B cell depletion going longer, could some of these patients eventually respond. So they're, in a, they're outside the study, but they follow the same protocol. And um, in addition to, these, uh, to this study, we have a patient study with 10 uh, patients uh, we, who are severely, severely ill. And uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge getting these patients to hospital. It, transportation, for example, is very uh, problematic for them because they're very, very sick patients. Uh, both the, these uh, groups are uh, following the same uh, treatment protocol, that is, as in the first randomized study, 0 and 14 days, and then new treatment after 3 months, 6 months, uh, 10 months, and 15 months, and then stop observation up to 3 years. No, up, no 3 years. Uh, that is ongoing. We have uh, recruited all the patients in the uh, phase 2 study. Uh, we've rec recruited three of the ten severely affected patients. As Eustan said, we have newly uh, an amendment for the protocol for the, 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 the patients who are, are worse. They have the possibility also of doing plasma exchange before uh, the same rituximab uh, treatment as the others. We won't go into that. And uh, concluding, we're new in the field. We don't have the experience that some of you have. But we are very sure that these patients that we have seen, they have a physical illness. We are very sure about that. We've seen very many ill patients in our oncology clinic, and many of these patients are, are really sick. We have shown, as objectively as we could, that major improvement can be achieved with B-cell uh, uh, depletion using the monoclonal clonal antibody rituximab. But I think that uh, the actual benefit of this concept will first be seen in the next study when we can fill in with a drug and see how the actual, um, it, it actually uh, benefits the patients. Uh, I did not remember that we have two pilot patients for this last study. Both of those patients have been given single treatments and have had relapse, and both of them are constantly uh, very near uh, healthy at the, at the time being, as they were before they got the disease. We believe that uh, CFS is an autoimmune disease, uh, which means that eventually 
autoantibodies will, will be found probably in most patients. And we're working very hard in the lab to, to find this. Saying that autoimmune, that, is, that it is an autoimmune disease does not mean that infections cannot be involved. Because we know that autoimmune processes often need a trigger. They need a trigger and they need something that, that keeps it going. So that uh, finding virus and bacteria, etc., can also be a mechanism of keeping an autoimmune process going. Um, I think that uh, our study should be repeated also by others. It has to be done if this is going to be an accepted treatment in the future. Uh, I think that uh, our results and those of other investigators here and, uh, and elsewhere uh, can help us in the future to, to define CFS more precisely as a biophysical disease. And we will soon, I think, be able to understand the symptoms of this uh, disease in a better way. And I also think that what we and others are doing will, in the public opinion and in the medical community, turn the attitude around concerning what CFS really is. And it will result in more biomedical research and possibilities for even better treatment in the future. Thank you.